Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Now you've had the good and the bad. Uh, now it's the turn of the ugly. Not, that is to say, those who are speaking, uh, but the principle of illegality as a defense to a claim. Many years ago, when I was learning contract law, I found the topic of illegality very difficult. Clear statements of principle seemed very difficult to find in the books or the cases. It wasn't any easier in practice until all seemed to be made clearer in Tinsley and Milligan in 1993 by the House of Lords. It seemed a lot more straightforward and clear, if perhaps rather harsh. But things don't stand still in the law, do they? And judges like to have their view, and the commentators insist on having their view. So when we get to Patel and Mertzer, we have the comment by Lord Sumption when he is able to say, the present appeal exposes, not for the first time, a long-standing schism between those judges and writers who regard the law of illegality as calling for the application of clear rules and those who would wish to address the equities of each case as it arises. Well, there we are. And that was a case where uh, they, you might say the schism remained because uh, the court was split six to three. So uh, how uh, is the court to approach the issue of illegality when raised as a defense to a claim based on contract, tort, or restitution as it used to be known as unjust enrichment as it is now? Has Patel and Mertzer abandoned principles going back 250 years, and if so, what new principles are there in its place? Has the schism been healed, or has this case just opened up another one? Well, we have three members of Brick Court Chambers to help us examine uh, these and doubtless other questions. And first of all, we shall hear from Charlotte Thomas. Charlotte. Well, in the Court of Appeal in Patel and Mirza, Lady Justice Gloucester expresses sympathy for what she calls hapless law students, not unlike Sir Richard, um, one of my dad hapless legal practitioners. And I would extend a bone of sympathy to the hapless judges who also have to face up to this area and attempt to derive clear principle. Um, I, I speak here just to declare my hand as judicial assistant to the Supreme Court during the time when a number of these cases were being decided. The unfortunate thing is that this confusion in the law has occurred despite a huge outpouring of judicial and law commissioner effort and a great amount of ink spilled from learned pens over the last several decades. It is, however, perhaps not surprising that it's difficult to find any one single clear unifying principle applicable across all areas of private law and in a multiplicity of factual contexts, including very often hard cases. Um, and we uh, can uh, see this, or so we, we heed the warning of Lord Justice Bingham in Saunders and Edwards, where he observed that judges here are steering a course between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, we have the principle that Lord Mansfield field set out so long ago, the courts must not aid or lend authority to a party seeking to pursue or enforce an object or agreement which the law prohibits, but at the same time the court must not, in his words, drop its skirts and refuse all assistance to a claimant, no matter how serious his loss or how disproportionate his loss to the wrongfulness of his conduct. What I've sought to do in the handout um, that you have before you is to summarise the law uh, in the run-up, as it were, to Patel and Mirza. So starting with the pre-Tins 
Kingsley Law, um, when various Court of Appeal decisions had taken a look at the multiplicity of rules that had sprung up, had thrown their hands up and said, well, what is this really? It's a question of public policy, uh, or rather public conscience. And the test that should be applied is, would it be an affront to the public conscience to allow the claim? And so Lord Justice Nichols in the Court of Appeal in Patel and Mirza says that what should happen is a weighing up of the interests involved, having regard to that public conscience test, um, which we should recall because it may start to sound familiar fairly shortly. Then, of course, we have that decision in Tinsley, which, as Sir Richard said, was supposed to clear it all up, and the reliance test propounded by the House of Lords, rejecting very clearly that old public conscience test, which Court of Appeal decisions had tried to introduce. Pretty quickly, this is part three of the handout, Tinsley was, well distinguished or softened or criticised, people deprobated the harsh results that it had the potential to produce, and in particular the potentially arbitrary results, depending on how exactly a case was to be pleaded um, on any individual facts. And what we've seen in particular is a large amount of Law Commission involvement. The first time the Law Commission looked at this, they recommended a structured statutory discretion. The second time they looked at this, they said, well, actually, we've had some House of Lords decisions now, and we think that the House of Lords is moving towards a kind of structured, factor-based public policy approach of the sort that we recommended. And those were decisions included Gray and Thames trains, Lord Hoffman's name once again being taken in vain in the context of this conference, where Lord Hoffman really just said as an aside in that case that the principle or the ex terpi causa maxim expresses not so much a principle as a policy which is based on a group of reasons that vary in different situations. That quote has been used in many subsequent cases, but the principle on which he based himself in Gray and Thames trains was simply causation. Did uh, the illegality in question cause the loss that was being sought by the claimant? If so, the claimant couldn't claim. And so the, the Law Commission after that case said, well, we still do need some statutory reform to get rid of Tinsley, because we still don't like that. But recent House, House, House of Lords cases do suggest that we can develop a more factor-based approach. And the Law Commission suggested the factors that it thought might be relevant in any such statutory discretion. Furthering the purpose of the rule infringed, consistency, the claimant shouldn't profit from his own wrong, deterrence, and so on. And courts took up that baton in decisions prior to Patel and Mirza. Um, in particular, I've picked out what some of the, uh, perhaps on, on some occasions uh, before they were Supreme Court judges, but what the various judges in Patel and Mirza had to say prior to that case, both uh, in court and extrajudicially. Um, Lord Toulson, uh, or Lord Justice Toulson as he then was in Parking Eye, adopted the Law Commission approach, essentially. Um, he sought to say that it was different from the public conscience test that had clearly been rejected in Tinsley because it involved a proportionality approach, um, and that meant that there was a more structured approach to the discretion being taken, enabling the court to weigh up policy factors as suggested by the Law, by the Law Commission. Lord Sumption and Lord Mance both pronounced extrajudicially on the topic, bemoaning the lack of certainty in the law, and both expressing some sympathy for the idea that there should be a statutory discretion of the type proposed by the Law Commission and of the type that has already been operating in New Zealand for many decades. And then we come to the recent cases where the Supreme Court has uh, been speaking on various sides of this question, um, not always being totally clear <coughs> the extent to which what they are saying should be applying to previous cases or not. The first of those is Hunger and Allen, where in 2014, um, Lord, Wil Lord Wilson gave a judgment in which he appeared, at least, to uh, wholesale uh, adopt and support the public policy approach of the type propounded by the Law Commission, albeit that he didn't expressly say that's what he was doing. The facts of Hunger were that 
claimant, the claimant was a Nigerian national who'd been working in breach of immigration law. She brought a claim in the statutory tort of discrimination for dismissal from her employment. Now, in the lower courts, she'd also brought contractual claims in respect of her lost wages, though those contract claims were not before the Supreme Court. And Lord Wilson there said, well, I have to follow Tilsley. It still carries maximum precedential authority, but he recognised that it's been criticised. He proposed that it should be softened by adopting the public policy approach, um, which had been favoured in Court of Appeal judgments such as Parking Eye and which had been suggested by the Law Commission. So he said the test is, what aspect of public policy founds the illegality defence? Does another aspect of public policy run counter to it? And then we must weigh these two up. What's not clear, unfortunately, from Lord Wilson's judgment is what he thinks the status of Gray and Thames train is after that. So what is the test in relation to tort? He doesn't approve of the causation test in Gray and Thames trains, which he says is itself subject to uncertainty because different judges can place weight on different features when assessing legal causation in any one case. So he seems to prefer the inextricable link test, but he doesn't say if his public policy approach is an expression of that test or an alternative to it. We then come to Servier, which Simon Salzidio is going to deal with in more detail. So I will simply note here that this is the case where Lord Sumption, in something of a departure from his previous extrajudicial pronouncement, takes a much firmer line on illegality. He says the ex terpi causa rule is a rule of judicial abstention, and it's one which is founded on a principle of consistency. He approves of the Gray causation test, saying that this is not a discretionary test, but it's a straightforward rule-based approach to deciding whether the illegality principle is engaged in any one case. And setting up the conflict for the later decision in Patel and Mirza, Lord Toulson agrees with Lord Sumption as to the outcome, but expresses his continued approval of the public policy test and the Law Commission approach in a concurring judgment. In Jativia, which was a case that dealt with attribution, which I won't be addressing today, the, if you will, the battle lines were drawn for Patel and Mirza. So Lord Sumption continues to support his approach in Servier. Um, he continues to say that Servier is consistent with Hunger and Allen because Hunger was a case of public policy of illegality that was overridden by a competing public policy and it doesn't depart from his rule-based as opposed to factor-based approach. Well, Toulson and Hodge, on the other hand, disagree with this rule-based approach and support their public policy uh, factor-based approach, which requires different factors to be con considered in each case to decide whether the defence applies to any given claim. And consequently, Lord Newberger says, well, we need to sort this out. We need to have a larger panel of the Supreme Court considering this as soon as possible. And that case was Patel and Mirza. Um, again, uh, Tom Adam will deal with the facts of this case in more detail, but in short, it concerned an insider dealing agreement um, where two parties agreed to use information held by the defendant to engage in insider dealing uh, using money from the claimant, and the claimant gave money to the defendant to that end. But the information in question never materialised, and so effectively the purpose of the contract failed. Now, this case has somewhat extraordinary facts because those initially assisting appear not to have appreciated the illegal nature of insider dealing. It was actually raised by the judge. And so in the very pleadings of the case, all of the facts that gave rise to the illegal agreement were set out. Not only did we have the conflict between the judges set up uh, and sort of presaged in Deteria and Bilter, but we also in this case had a proxy academics battle. So in the red corner, we had Lord Toulson and Lord Burroughs, uh, Lord Burroughs, sorry, uh, Andy Burroughs, Professor Burroughs, frustrated law commissioners, um, and Professor Burroughs's writings were relied upon by Lord Toulson in his judgment, while in the blue corner, Professor Virgo was advising one of the parties and uh, took a much, and, and advocates a more sort of strict rule-based approach, rule approach of the type favoured by the minority. 
Looking at the decision then, to borrow from Lord Hoffman, we have the judges giving characteristically polemical speeches. Um, Lord Newberger, in fact, is the only one who expresses much reluctance about setting down general principles beyond the fact of this case. And this is so despite the fact that we know from the history I briefly outlined that from their previous judicial and non-judicial pronouncements, the judges clearly find this a difficult area of law. Nonetheless, it's clear from the majority judgment, which was a five-person majority um, and so ha has, has the majority of the court, that we do now have a sea change in the law. I'll start first by trying to identify some common ground across all of the judgments. First of all, it does seem clear that this is a question of public policy, not statutory construction. Indeed, in Patel itself, the statute expressly said that contracts of this type were not void or unenforceable purely by reason of the statute. And so it is a question of the common law as to what the effect of the illegality is going to have in any one case. Second, all judges embrace consistency as an animating feature of the law of illegality. So everybody cites the brilliant judgment of Justice McLachlan and Hall and Habert. It's effectively attained the status of Lord Mansfield's uh, uh, pronouncement in Holman and Johnson as being one of those um, extracts that each judge has to put in every single case before they can move on and say what they think about the law. But the problem is, despite everybody agreeing that it's a rule of public policy and that it's a rule that's based on consistency, we still have these very different approaches as to what the outcome should be, as to what the reasoning should be, albeit that the outcome is the same for every judge. All judges also say that it's useful to have regard to the Canadian and Australian case law, including that decision in Hall and Habert, but again, without really analysing them terribly closely. Um, in fact, in Hall and Habert, a very, very restrictive approach to illegality was taken, more restrictive than the one in Gray and Thames trains, and yet, uh, and she disapproved of the sort of broader public policy approach that was being advocated in that case, and yet even the majority is able to invoke her in support of their view because they say it's about consistency, but we think about consistency very differently. What then are the, are, the, are the rules that we can derive from the majority judgment in Patel and Mirza? Well, Tinsley is gone. In fact, even the minority, or Lord Sumption, says, I agree with the reliance-based approach propounded in Tinsley, but I think they applied it right. So um, it's definitely gone, and for the majority, it's been expressly overruled and replaced by their public policy multi-factor test. Um, and these are the factors set out by Lord Toulson at paragraph 93 of his judgment. Um, they include how seriously illegal the contract was, whether there is intention involved, how central the, the conduct is to the contract, how serious the sanction is, and then whether denying enforcement will further the purpose of the rule, acting as a deterrent, allow a party to profit from the conduct or avoid inconsistency in the law. But he emphasizes this isn't a closed list. Other factors can be relevant as well. And the thing is, when we look down this list of factors, many of them really express or are different features of the consistency approach. Um, and the minority, I think, seizes on this. So Lord Sumption says what we're looking at is the policy of the rule making the conduct unlawful. We can weigh other public policies against it, and he says this is what happened in hunger, and that's why it's consistent with his view. Very briefly, then, I'm just going to ask what's the effect of Patel and Mirza on different types of claim. Tom's going to discuss the effect on unjust enrichment in detail, but really the judgment is a vindication of the idea that unjust enrichment restores the status quo and is very different from cases which allow a party to profit from a wrong. Um, by contrast with contract, the case law had gotten into something of a mess. The Law Commission expressly said, well, it's good that the courts are disregarding the rules and treating them as more like guidelines. And this Jack Sparrow approach to the law, I think, is now supported um, by the judgment of the majority in Patel and Mirza, say that now courts will be invited to discuss openly the different public policy factors that they weigh in contract cases. As for tort, I think we have to conclude that the causation test in Gray and Thames trains is now effectively gone, or rather causation is only one factor that the court will weigh in as part of this structured discretion test. So causation is one of the factors that tell us how closely connected the, the illegality is to the claim, but the court should also weigh in the balance matters such as the seriousness of the conduct and whether there was intention and so on. 
What is repeatedly emphasized then, despite the fact that we're going to have some more uncertainty deciding now exactly how the structured discretion approach should be applied in the cases, what is repeatedly emphasized that the application of the fence should be relatively rare, and so in theory at least it should be constrained to those cases where it's really relevant, but there's plainly lots to be argued about in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Now, uh, Tom Adam will speak next. Thank you, Charlotte. Well, as trailed, I'm going to speak in more detail just about Patel and Mirza. Uh, Patel and Mirza is the most authoritative decision in this long list of authorities. I should probably say it is currently the most authoritative decision in this long line of authorities because given the radical nature of what it has done, it's not entirely fanciful to, to suppose that in 20 years' time a panel of 11 justices of the Supreme Court could be sitting there saying, did the Supreme Court take a wrong turning in Patel and Mirza? Uh, anyway, it's, it's where we are. Uh, we, we've got to grapple with it. And to begin with, you've got to understand what the facts are. Uh, and the facts are so perfect an illustration of the problems that arise in the law of illegality that I'm not actually entirely convinced this is a real case at all. It seems to me the whole thing may be a gigantic practical joke dreamt up by members of an Oxford College's law faculty. This is a, a portrait of the law faculty of Worcester College in the late 1920s. The chap on the left is saying, no, no, it would be much funnier if it's a snail in a ginger beer bottle. Let's do that one. Uh, anyway, Working for present purposes on the assumption this is a real case, which has got real facts, where you need to know what they are. So Mr. Merza was a crook. There's no doubt about that. He was a crook. And he needed some money to make his crookery more profitable. His, his particular scheme was uh, to speculate, spread bet, on the shares of RBS. And he had got a man on the inside of discussions with the government and RBS who knew... Uh, what was being said and what was going to be announced, knew it before the market, he was going to pass it on to Mr. Merza, and Mr. Merza was going to get the drop on the share price. Now, the way spread betting works is that the more cash you put up, the more you can gear your bet, so you get better odds, as it were. And so Merza was going around trying to raise cash. Uh, he met Mr. Patel at a poker game, which is why I think this may be made up by a bunch of Lordons, because I mean, really, seriously, in a poker game? He met him at a poker game and said, oh, I've got this great scheme. Mr. Patel said, that sounds absolutely fantastic. Um, I, I'm in. Uh, let, let me get some money together. So he goes off and raises 600,000 quid and passes it off to Mr. Merza. Now, it went wrong because Mr. Merza's mole on the inside wasn't as good as he thought it was going to be. He didn't come up with the inside information. They didn't get to place the spread bet. So n nothing happened. And so Mr. Patel, after a bit, said, oh, I'd quite like that money back, please, if you don't mind. And Mr. Merz said, oh, the check's in the post. Um, oh, the dog may have eaten it. Uh, have you looked down the back of the sofa? All that sort of thing. And eventually, Mr. Patel got fed up with it. And he, he, he actually went to lawyers and said, I'm a crook. I'd like some help. Um, he obviously went to some lawyers who were used to this sort of thing. Uh, that's for the Breaking Bad fans among you. Uh, if he'd come into my room in Chambers, I don't think he'd have lasted very long. But, you know, they, they were completely unabashed. They pleaded out the whole story just the way I've told it. Yes, we have a legal agreement to uh, try, use inside information. Uh, we want our money back. It's a disgrace. So the, the, the decisions... I haven't got time to talk about the decisions below, which must be one of the incredibly frustrating things about being in the Court of Appeal or First Instance Judge. You do a really, really good judgment. Nobody's interested in it because it's got to the Supreme Court. The, the judgments are really good, especially that uh, uh, of Elizabeth Gloucester in the Court of Appeal, and I commend it to you, but we don't have time to, to think about them. Basically, what you need to know is that they all went, because they're below the, the, the level of the biggest cheeses, they went down the orthodox lines, Tinsley and Milligan. This is about reliance, the reliance test. That test is, in, is in a nutshell, do you have to advance your own illegal conduct in order to bring your claim? If you do, the court won't hear it. If you can get round having to rely on your own illegal conduct, then the court will hear your claim. Uh, that's it. So the, the, the decisions went below. Uh, I put it in the handout. You can see, see what they said. Now, when it got to the Supreme Court, all nine, because they'd assembled a panel of nine, because um, they, they recognized that the law of illegality was in a state of flux and uncertainty, they wanted to get it straight. 
So he got a panel of nine, and they all agreed that Mr. Patel could recover. And, and I pause there to record my own absolute astonishment at this proposition. Uh, it, th this reduces the law to a level where I can just invest some money. Uh, you know, I have been an investor in criminal enterprise. And if the criminal enterprises don't go through, I can get my money back. There's absolutely no problem with that. I can rock up at the RCJ. I can say, I, g I gave some people half a million quid to drill into the London silver vaults in Shortsbury Lane. They told me it was going to be really expensive. They'd have to bribe the security guard and buy a really good digger. And they haven't. It's an hour. I want my money back. And the court goes, yes, absolutely fine. And, and it, there we are. Now, the, the disagreement was a, a really fundamental one, which was about by what route Mr. Patel could recover. What was the legal theory? Are we going to rewrite the law of illegality or not? And the minority, that's uh, Lords Mance, Sumption and Clark, no shortage of brain power there, they said, look, we've got to stick with the tried and tested. The reliance test is good law. We can refine it. Yes, it has been a bit arbitrary in the past. We can do it better. We can explain it better. But we've got to have clear rule. This is clear, comprehensible. Everybody can, can get it. It's practical because it's the narrowest test that we've ever identified. So we're not in the business of turning away lots of people from the RCJ. We want claims. That's our business justice. So we're, we're not trying to cut everybody out. But um, there, there are limits, and this is a limit. So let's stick with it. And it's principled because it maintains the integrity of the justice system. You, you, you don't, on the one hand, say, this is improper conduct, and the other, other hand say, yes, you can base a claim on it. So uh, that, that was their view. Now, the majority decision was that we needed to start again. And to understand that, you have to understand that Lord Toulson was, as uh, Charlotte described him, a, a frustrated law commissioner. And being a law commissioner must be a really rubbish job because you spend your whole time thinking up very sophisticated and excellent reforms to the law. You write a terrifically learned report. You put it on the desk of Parliament to enact, and Parliament goes, yeah, we're not busy. We're, I mean, we're too busy. We're not interested in that. We, we're, we're doing other things. We're calling each other names and arguing about boundary reform. So, sorry, uh, that, that all gets parked. And basically, Lord Tilson had had enough. And he's saying, you know what? I'm in the Supreme Court now. I can just do this. Uh, and, and he put into the case law what Parliament had declined to put in the statute. So basically, his judgment is, here is what the Law Commission thought, isn't it? Brilliant. Now it's the law. <laughs> and uh, so he, he gets after a very, very long run through the law. He finally gets to the point where he says, the reliance test is out, it's gone. So that's it. We can, we can put it aside. Uh, you no longer have to apply that rule, that slide rule, to the facts of the case that you're trying to advise on or argue or, or adjudicate upon. Instead, it's going to be replaced. So, right, what's it going to be replaced by? And, and this is where things get slightly less clear. Here's his first stab at saying what it's going to be replaced by. So what we've all, this is what we've all got to do now. We've got to have regard to the policy factors involved and to the nature and circumstances of the illegal conduct in determining whether the public interest in preserving the integrity of the justice system should result in denial of the relief claimed. So that's pretty high level, frankly. You know, uh, uh, that, that's not, not a test that's as easy to apply as, as the reliance test. Uh, it, it essentially boils down to, well, do you think it's right or not, really? That, that's all it is. But to be fair to Lord Tilson, he comes back and has another go. So it's more detailed at paragraph 120. So uh, he, he says it's necessary. First is a three-stage test. We like three stages. It's good. First, it is necessary to consider the underlying purpose of the prohibition which has been transgressed and whether that purpose will be enhanced by denial of the claim. That's actually fairly comprehensible and concrete. Uh, that, that, you know, that, that, to the harassed pr practitioner, is, is quite useful. Then we've got to consider any other relevant public policy mm -hmm. on which the de denial of the claim may have an impact. Mm -hmm. And then we've got to consider whether denial of the claim would be a proportionate response to the illegality, bearing in mind that punishment is a matter of the criminal courts, which is why I've called this crime but no punishment. So that, again, has, um, it, it is vague. I've highlighted in red various factors may be relevant. Charlotte's already given you those factors. I'm not going to read them out because they are m manifest and manifold. They point in different directions. Some of them are easier to consider than others. Some of them are easier to apply than others. Who knows? And where you get to on this is that almost everything, Charlotte politely called it a structured discretion, but I, I think really where it gets to is it all depends now on the gut feeling of the judge. That's it. 
It, we used to be able to say in chambers, dirty dogs don't win cases. Well, that's gone. The issue is, is there a dirtier dog somewhere else in the case? Because if there is, you may still be able to win. The issue is not how good you are, but how good do you look compared to the other guy? Mr. Patel, it was uniformly thought, was not as bad as Mr. Merza. It would be outrageous to leave Mr. Merza with the money. So what we must do is give Mr. Patel back his sea capital so he can have another go at another criminal scheme somewhere else down the line. We're giving money to a man who has proven himself to be willing to invest in criminal enterprises, and, and he can try again. There we are. Uh, but he wasn't as bad, it was thought, as Mr. Merza. And this whole thing becomes extraordinarily subjective. And the public conscience test, which was widely ridiculed um, you know, through the 90s and 2000s as, as being too, too vague and fuzzy, is now back. This list of factors and the, the test I articulated uh, in paragraph 120, this is just the public conscience test with some intellectual pretensions. That's all it is. So that you, when you're looking to the future, the first thing is it's actually now become incredibly difficult to predict the outcome of cases. And I, I'm going to quote from Lord Mance because I really can't put it any better myself. It says, the new in approach introduces not only a new era, but entirely novel dimensions into any issue of illegality. The courts will be required to make a value judgment by reference to a widely spread melange of ingredients about the overall merits or strengths in a highly unspecific, non-legal sense of the respective claims of the public interest and each of the parties. And, and that is absolutely right, in my view. We are now in a legal soup through which we have to swim as practitioners. I'm not pretending that it was always easy before to uh, uh, apply the reliance test. And I, I was for the successful auditors in Stone and Rolls and Moore Stevens. And we encountered every shade of judicial opinion on the journey from first to last in, in that case. Gordon Langley, at first instance, thought it was quite funny, uh, the, the defence, but uh, he didn't say, oh, well, claims against orders is really ought to go forward, basically. The Court of Appeal thought that the, the defence was absolutely right and that the claim was ridiculous. The company was crooked. How could it possibly sue its auditors for failing to detect that it was a crook? I mean, they just thought it was absurd, threw it out. And in the, when we got to the House of Lords, it's the closest I've ever seen the Judicial Committee come to fisticuffs, actual fisticuffs on the bench. They were furious with each other. We just had to stand back, really, and let them, let them go at each other. I mean, it, it really divided opinions. So it wasn't easy before, but now it's impossible. Uh, th this is so difficult. So there are very specific claims that arise. First is the money-back claims. This, this is a strange new world. Mr. Patel wanted his money back. He didn't want the profits from the bets which should have been placed. It wasn't a negligence claim for placing the wrong bets. It's nothing like that. He just wanted his money back. And the law now is you get your money back. It doesn't matter that it was a criminal enterprise. You get your money back if you put it in. So you could find this gentleman. You could give him £10,000 to um, take out somebody you, you don't like, a law commissioner, for example. Um, and, and if, if, if the, the, the target has a heart attack before he gets there or, or is already dead because neither of you knew that or, or he doesn't feel like it, that doesn't matter you, you, and he won't give you your money back, you can sue him. That's absolutely fine. There's no problem. Now, you're probably thinking, this is ridiculous. I mean, you know, there can't be any actual support for this proposition in Patel and Meza because it's a, it's a legal chestnut that goes back to 1801. There's, there's no way there's any support for that. Right. So look at this. This is Lord Newberger. If the claimant paid a sum to the defendant to commit a crime, such as a murder or a robbery, it seems to me that the claimant should normally be able to recover the sum, irrespective of whether the defendant had committed or even attempted to commit the crime. Now, this is the President of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, who is actually writing this. He's actually saying, yes, no, there's no problem, yes, hit me hit man. He, sh he should have his money back. Uh, at this point, in my view, you have entered a parallel legal universe. I just, I simply do not understand how anybody could even have that thought, let alone commit it to the law reports. There we are. Um, those are money back claims. You, you, you get your money back. And the short point is, there's now no claim too bad to have a go at. Why not? Um, so, uh, we, we've got, yeah, sorry, that's, that, that was my reaction <laughs> when I read that paragraph of law. I thought, I must have got this wrong. I went, I went out and I had a cup of tea, I came back, I read it, no, it still, it still said that. <laughs> there we are. Um, so, the, 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 I know I'm up against, I don't really have time to talk about the car anom anomaly, but um, it, essentially he said, 
he got Lord Carr's judgment is quite interesting because what he does is say the minority are outrageous legal shysters. Look at the tricks they're playing. They say, no, no, you can't have a claim under contract except be enforcing the contract. It's very bad. That's against the reliance test. Oh, but if we call it a, an unjust enrichment claim, that's no problem because you're not relying on your illegal contract. And that was the reasoning of the minority. Lord Carr said that is ridiculous. I mean, you cannot have this kind of intellectual inconsistency. Fine. But what he doesn't seem to realize is the mirror image of that, is that since he was allowing the claim on the basis of unjust enrichment, he would have allowed it on the basis of contract too. And there's no escaping from that conclusion. So if, the, I mean, the claim was pleaded every which way by the people who didn't think about illegality, including breach of contract. So if you maintain the claim saying, well, I had a contract with this bloke and it's an implied term, being so obvious as to go without saying that if he didn't do the RBS crime, I get my money back, it, 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 th then you could enforce that on Lord Carr's view of life. Well, there we go. Crimes under foreign law, incredibly complicated. What, what if you've got something that is not a crime here, but is a crime in Russia or Kazakhstan or China or wherever it is? I, I don't know. Um, we'll have to chuck that one in. That'll come up at some point. And then a specific example is insurance policies which can't be avoided. Now, this is, this is real world. This is happening at the moment. You've got lots of insurance policies in the market which say you can't avoid this insurance policy. And uh, you get it got it in the film finance cases, which Richard tried. Uh, you, you, got, um, you get it in the security for costs applications. I was arguing one in the Court of Appeal two weeks ago about a, an insurance policy that had been put up by way of fortification uh, of a cross undertaking damages. So these policies are out there. And there are all sorts of different wordings. But some of them actually go as far as to say, we agree that even if the insured has committed an inducing fraud to bring about this policy, it, it's not avoidable. Um, there we are. Now, there is clear authority uh, in HIH and Chase Manhattan in the House of Lords, Lord Hoffman, Lord Bingham, saying you can't contract out of the consequences of being a crook. That's public policy. You can't do it. So that's what we all understood, isn't it? Well, oh, <laughs> that's, very, that's very last week, that is. Um, no, I, and then th this was the point that was taken in, in the Court of Appeals. They know it's all about, it's all about Patel and Murs, it's all about public policy. If the insurance policy is, is actually to benefit somebody else and not the crook, then well, why shouldn't you contract in that manner, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, we, we're genuinely off to the races now uh, on, on this point. Uh, I'm going to end with something Lord Sumption said. He said that we'll be doing the development of the law no favours uh, if we simply substitute a new mess for the old one. Well, I've managed to get hold of a, a secret picture of Lord Toulson and Lord Sumption discussing the case. I'm, I'm going to leave you to work out which one is which. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Well, I don't think we can have another comedy act after that, um, but uh, we can have Simon Salzido, and he's going to speak <laughs> last on this. Well, uh, thank you very much for that introduction, Richard. Um, I did, uh, well, I, I'm going to speak on, on what is a turpitude, to take the, the word that comes from that Latin, ex turpi, uh, or illegality if you prefer. Um, and uh, although, as Richard says, I'm not as funny as Tom, um, I did do one thing the same as him, which is I started by uh, looking on the internet for pictures of turpitude which might be suitable to illustrate this talk. And... Um, what do you know? The internet is full of pictures of turpitude, but hardly any of them I felt were suitable to illustrate this talk. So you can look for them yourselves later if you like. Um, I did find two that I thought would be uh, okay. Here is one. I think that the person illustrated is plainly intended to be a lawyer. Um, I, I don't think it's me. Is it any of you? Maybe. Um, uh, if so, you probably want to keep that to yourself. Uh, and this, I think, is some American law students demonstrating their understanding of the concept of illegality. I don't know if you can read the words. I, th I think you can. Uh, illegal is a crime, and what part of illegal don't you understand? So we'll see if we can answer uh, any of that. My talk really takes the form of a case note on one of the cases that Charlotte mentioned, Le Laboratoire Servier against Apotex, which was decided by the Supreme Court in October 2014. Um, now, the facts are slightly involved, but they're really necessary if you want to sort of understand how, how the particular issue arose. So concentrate hard for the next 60 seconds or so, 
the, the last 10 minutes is then very straightforward. Um, Apotex was a uh, manufacturer and seller uh, of generic drugs, and it copied one of Servier's drugs. It was manufacturing them in Canada, and it wanted to start selling them into the UK, and I think it did start. Servier, as is the way in this business, uh, got an injunction in the Chancery Division prohibiting Apotex from continuing to sell its drugs in England. Uh, it then turned out that Servier's European patent was invalid, so the injunction was wrongly granted. So there was then uh, going to be the usual inquiry into damages. So this is the uh, money lost by Apotex through not being allowed to sell its drugs into the UK. The complicating factor is that the patent which Servier had in Canada turned out to be valid. Um, so the manufacturer of Apotex's drugs that it was going to sell into England um, would still have infringed the Canadian patent. And there was an action proceeding in Canada for the infringements that did take place, um, and of course no action for the infringements that didn't, that's to say the manufacture of additional drugs to sell into England, because that didn't happen because of the injunction. So the inquiry into damages was what uh, compensation would Apotex be given for being prohibited from selling into the UK drugs which it would have manufactured in Canada in infringement of Servier's Canadian patent. So the illegality that was, uh, arose, that uh, was raised by Servier, was that if compensation was granted for the uh, wrongly granted injunction stopping Apotex selling into England, the effect of that would be to condone Apotex's infringement of Servier's Canadian patent. And Canadian law is like English law in this respect. The infringement of a patent is a tort, and it's a tort of strict liability, so there's no, no mens rea required. So the argument was, if you do that, you are, uh, you, if the court grants compensation for that, the court is condoning the tort of infringement of a patent, albeit in Canada. Um, so this raised a number of uh, issues. And the, 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 the key issue which I want to talk about is whether the tort of infringing a Canadian patent is turpitude for the purposes of the principle of ex terpi causa or illegality. Uh, there was no issue made of the fact that the patent was a foreign one and that the infringement was a foreign law. Um, th th although Tom said that was very much up in the air, there's a fairly strong line of cases in other contexts, particularly in the context of, of, of uh, illegal contracts, that says that illegality in foreign law, in the relevant foreign law anyway, is treated pretty much uh, as being as good as uh, or as bad as uh, contravention of English law. Uh, but there were remarkably few authorities about whether a tort would qualify as illegality or what would qualify as illegality. In all the previous cases, the issue turpitude was, was treated as the proverbial elephant. Judges felt they could recognize it, but nobody had really attempted to describe it. Um, the at first instance, Mr. Justice Arnold held that the claim for compensation under the cross-undertaking was barred by the principle of ex terpi causa. He held that the breach of a Canadian patent was a sufficiently serious piece of illegality in all the circumstances to bar the claim. Um, and he, he set out the relevant circumstances, um, which he, he thought were, were the key ones. The Court of Appeal overturned that judgment, holding that the claim was not barred. Um, and it's relevant just to note that one of the matters they thought was quite relevant was that just before the Court of Appeal hearing, Apotex conceded that it would have to give credit against any compensation it was awarded for the sum that it would have been ordered by a Canadian court to pay by way of damages for infringement of the Canadian patent. So I told you I had to listen to the facts earlier to see how that fits in. So the Canadian court was, going to, was in fact, as it happens, going to decide the principles of how damages would be assessed because the Canadian court was dealing with uh, Apotex's other breaches of Servier's patent, uh, and Apotex accepted, just before the Court of Appeal hearing, that whatever the outcome of that, those principles could then be applied to work out what damages the Canadian court would have awarded if it had sold into England as well and therefore manufactured even more in Canada. Um, 
the Court of Appeal held that both parties were too dogmatic in trying to argue that a tort either was illegality or was not illegality. Um, that, that was not a question that the court thought was, was the right question. Instead, the court is able to take into account a wide range of considerations in order to ensure that, de that the defence only applies where it is a just and proportionate response to the illegality involved in the light of the policy considerations underlying it. Um, so that was the, the Court of Appeal's view, uh, and their view was that particularly in the light of this concession, uh, to bar the claim altogether would not be the just and proportionate response, so they didn't. Went up to the Supreme Court, where the leading judgment was given by Lord Sumption, with whom Lords Newberger and Clark agreed. Lord Sumption said the Court of Appeal's approach to this was wrong because it was discretionary in all but name. The question what is involved uh, had given rise to a body of inconsistent authority, as I've told you, which never really gave any general principle. Um, uh, so Lord Sumption did set out uh, the principles as to what was turpitude, based on all the previous case law, but, but uh, raising it to the level of principle. The paradigm case of turpitude, as the American law students um, know, is crime. So committing a criminal act is generally turpitude. But there are also quasi-criminal acts which engage the public interest in the same way. Case, uh, cases in particular torts of dishonesty and corruption there are some anomalous categories of misconduct like prostitution, which feature in some of the very old cases that we all uh, learned at law school, and they're just treated as anomalous categories, which are still apparently turpitudinous. Um, and there are infringement of statutory rules for the protection of the public interest, which give rise to civil sanctions of a penal character, such as breaches of competition law. Um, and finally, of course, there's the slightly different category of contracts which are prohibited by law, which give rise to no enforceable rights. Uh, so that's all set out, a list of what counts as turpitude, rather helpful. There are also exceptions, of course. This is uh, law. There's always exceptions. Um, cases of strict liability crimes uh, are exceptions. If the claimant wasn't privy to the facts that made his conduct unlawful, then even though he's committed a crime, that's not necessarily turpitude. So it's not always crime. And the exception has an exception, too. Uh, e even if you didn't know that what you were doing amounted to a crime, you didn't know the relevant facts, um, the, you, you can't get damages which would effectively reverse the penalty imposed upon you by a criminal court because that breaches the principle of consistency that Charlotte mentioned, which everyone uh, agrees after that famous judgment in the Canadian Supreme Court is uh, one of the fundamental reasons behind the policy barring illegality, is to keep the law consistent. So there's that exception. So there you have it, um, and uh, Lord Mance gave a short judgment, didn't, didn't, um, didn't simply join in Lord Sumption's, but gave a short judgment which uh, did in fact agree with Lord Sumption on the key points. So uh, four out of five members of the Supreme Court agreed that there was a clear list of what counted as turpitude and, and uh, set it out in the law reports in October 2014. The fifth member of the court on that occasion was Lord Tulson, who said, I would make no criticism of the Court of Appeal for considering whether public policy considerations merited applying the doctrine of illegality to the facts of the present case, although he agreed that they did not. And he also placed weight on this last-minute concession about giving credit for the damages from the Canadian court. So he thought that was important in terms of whether the claim was barred by illegality. Uh, now, as you have heard, Patel and Mirza then came before the Supreme Court less than two years later, Lords Sumption, Mance and Clark stuck to their guns um, in relation to Servier and Apotex. Lord Newberger effectively changed sides and Lord Toulson's view found itself in the majority. And it's implicit, I think, in Lord Toulson's judgment, but it's explicit in Lord Kerr's, that in Servier and Apotex, the Court of Appeals approach is now to be preferred to that of the Supreme Court. So it follows that even a tort of strict liability and even a foreign tort of strict liability, can engage the ex terpi principle. So illegality can arise uh, from a, uh, uh, a mere tort of strict liability. Um, uh, and it's perhaps interesting in the context of, of what uh, uh, Tom was making the point, that the approach in Patel and Mirza uh, seems to narrow illegality in the sense that they all thought that it was okay to put your money into an unlawful scheme and you could still, the courts would still help you to recover it. But in this sense, 
the, the possible the potential applicability of the principle is massively widened because there's no previous authority suggesting that any tort other than one of dishonesty could found uh, an, a, a, a defense of illegality. Uh, and yet here it now appears to be the case that anything which is in any sense uh, unlawful and possibly anything that's uh, immoral if it's, uh, if it's held to engage the relevant public policy against immorality um, w can found a defense of illegality. So my conclusions are it seems that uh, if you started looking at this question, what's unlawfulness, you might be led to the Supreme Court's decision in Servier and Apotex, but if so, you would be misled because I don't think that that decision can survive Patel and Mirza. It follows that no list can ever be made of uh, matters that constitute illegality uh, or turpitude, uh, and instead any act which can be alleged in some uh, uh, forceful way to be illegality potentially opens up the argument, which then has to be determined on the range of factors approach. Presumably, proportionality will be the answer quite often if, or, or if the only illegality involved is a, uh, a tort of strict liability. But it's quite interesting that in Servier itself, the first instance judge thought that a tort of strict liability was enough in those circumstances. And the judges that were following what we now know to be the correct approach, the range of factors, the Court of Appeal and Lord Torson, those judges all place great weight on that concession, which also suggests that they thought that the commission of a tort, even a tort of strict liability, w w could well in other circumstances be sufficient to give rise to a successful uh, defence and application of uh, illegality. And of course, it's not just a defence. It's a matter, as we know, that the court is obliged to take of its own motion if it spots it. So that's a point that could uh, arise much more widely. Um, so uh, the law on this is thrown wide open, and uh, I think it's a, it's a real opportunity for points to be taken that uh, might look like the kind of points that, that Tom would laugh at, um, but nevertheless uh, are now a very real potential points. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Simon. Well, there's a fine mess you've got us in. I, I, imagine this. Two modern-day highwaymen slant Robin Hoods. They agree to hold up a limo in which there are two hedges and their girlfriends with their Cartier watches and jewellery on going to some posh do. But the highwaymen have agreed that the proceeds of this exercise will go to the deserving poor. The job's done. They each take half of the spoils because it's easier to convert them into money that way. A uh, does the job gets the money, gives it away. B doesn't fulfill his side of the bargain. The hedges are so embarrassed by this that they won't sue for the money or the goods. So A decides that he will and says that this is all subject to some kind of quiz close trust. Can he succeed? Well, I think we can perhaps debate that kind of thing in the next part of the session.